many reasons. I did stick, stick around at West Virginia and did a postdoc there, and then I became research faculty. Um, and then um, after um, my husband's job changed a little bit and he was a little bit more free to move, we started looking at um, tenure track positions. And um, that's how I ended up at UNH, where I am now. And I've been here for almost three years now. Um, so that's sort of my trajectory. <laughs> awesome. And, and what about the science that you do? So now I um, have a mix of things. Um, and this is where I have some slides. Is this the good, a good time to show those? Oh, um, actually, no, you're right. That is the next question. <laughs> so yeah, save it. And also I did want to get back later on, we'll get back to your REU experience as well, your undergraduate experience. Okay. So thanks for reminding me. That was the next question. Sure. Great. Dr. Kareem Sarathia, do you want to go next? So describe your career path and what inspired you to pursue. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and, and yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so I think I would describe my career path as probably meandering. Um, I think an important sort of instigator was uh, in high school, I ended up taking a astronomy class as an elective, thinking it would just be like a neat, uh, cool science class. Um, I didn't realize it was actually being taught by the football coach at the school. And I guess it must have been some sort of legal issue, like because it was a public high school, the guy, even though he was only there to teach football, actually had to teach, uh, coach football actually had to teach a class. And so it was me and like most of the football team in this class. And it was a disaster. Like we watched all of the Star Wars movies and had exams with essay questions on each one. Um, it was such a, a, a terrible class, but you know, I, they have a textbook for that class. And you know, I, I read it cover to cover. Um, and even though the fellow wasn't a very good teacher, he was actually a really good coach. Like he saw that I was interested in this stuff and he went out of his way to talk to other teachers, to get me other books. He sort of let me, you know, sit in the back and read whatever I felt like during class. Um, and after all of that, he actually nominated me for this research intern program at the National Security Agency. And so because of that, I actually got to spend in my fourth year of high school, I would sort of go for a couple of classes in the morning and then spend the rest of the day uh, working at the National Security Agency with sort of the math and computer science researchers there. Uh, and so that was pretty, a very cool experience. You know, I got a, a top secret security clearance the same year I got a, a driver's license. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that was just a very early on like experience to sort of working with researchers and that really just stuck with me uh, after that. Like going into college where I majored in math, I sort of was always working as a research assistant, assistant in some lab or another. And then when I went from there to going to grad school, you know, it made it much easier since I had, you know, plenty of people to write me letters of recommendation. I had sort of previous research experience. Uh, and that was also really helpful. I got like a, an NSF fellowship to sort of pay for it. Um, and then going into grad school, I was uh, doing my PhD in applied mathematics uh, officially, but my advisor was in the astrophysics department. And so um, my doctoral work was sort of using a at the time, one of the largest supercomputers on the planet to sort of model uh, the swirling disks of plasma around black holes, uh, basically <laughs> this picture in the background. Um, and so that was really neat. Um, I did sort of similar work uh, as a postdoc. And around that time, I sort of realized that the astrophysics job market was a wasteland of uh, broken dreams and <laughs> decided to do something else for a while. Um, and the nice thing, of course, you know, by that point, I was a guy who could make a big Super, a big computer to solve a hard math problem. And it was very easy to sort of transition and do other things for a while. So I spent some time at NASA working with the climate scientists there, then went to Johns Hopkins uh, physics lab, worked on various projects, uh, one of which was uh, uh, actually sort of uh, modeling blood flow around aneurysms. So I sort of have all my plasma uh, modeling bases covered. Um, but, you know, I, I always, you know, plasma physics was always my first love. It's sort of plasma is my blood. And so eventually started working with uh, the actual uh, geospace scientists at APL. And since then, I've been doing work on uh, uh, space physics and uh, modeling. Fantastic. Thank you. So a common theme from both of you is, is that you didn't stay on the same path that you thought you were going to be on when you first started out. And that's totally OK. Sometimes we find our path while we're on it. We, you know, we kind of have to feel our way through it a little bit. So thank you so much. All right, the next question. Um, 
So go ahead and describe some um, of the work that you're doing, why it's important and why we should care. And if you have any slides at this point, feel free to share them. And Professor Kesey, let's go ahead and start with you. Okay, thanks. So the thing that I've sort of been working on for many years, including from that initial um, project that I did as a grad student is um, taking advantage of um, a special technique called energetic neutral atom imaging. I will not test you on this later. You're good. You can forget that if you need to. But basically, um, so if you look at the space that's surrounding Earth, that's the region that I study, and it's called the magnetosphere. So it's called that because it's within the bubble of the magnetic field of Earth. And you can't actually see it. It doesn't emit light or photons. So you can't just take a picture of it to see what's going on. Now that's good for, you know, looking out in the night sky and seeing the moon and seeing the stars. There's nothing blocking um, there, but it makes it kind of harder to study what's going on because it's not emitting the light. That's why the solar physicists have it so easy because they just take pictures all the time because they have lots of beautiful pictures of, you know, all these photons coming from the sun. We don't have that in the magnetosphere. So a lot of the measurements in the magnetosphere are local to whatever satellite you have up there. So we've got lots of satellites that are taking measurements all the time, but the measurement only happens where the satellite is and the satellite's moving in its orbit all the time. So that's the only place you get a measurement. But the technique that I use actually takes advantage of some collisions so that we can actually take a remote sort of a picture, um, but not with photons, um, to study what the ions are doing. So uh, the technique that I use um, ends up allowing us to create a map of the magnetosphere and the view of uh, the temperatures of the ions. So I'm going to share this uh, slide here. So this is basically a temperature map that I create um, using this technique. So in this picture, Earth is at the center of this. Now this disk is a little bit bigger than Earth. It's about three times the size of Earth. The sun is off to the right and you're looking down at the North Pole. Uh, this dashed line is what's called geosynchronous orbit. That's where we have a whole lot of satellites like the GPS satellites. Um, lots of satellites are at this orbit. So it's a common thing that we talk about. So we get a feel for spatial scales. But in this temperature map, so this color, shows us the temperatures and you can see we get some hot regions and they're in these sort of localized blobs and so i can look and see where where are these hot blobs happening and in this study what i did was actually take a look at another um, satellite called mms that is taking those local measurements and it was pretty close to that hot blob and i compared the temperatures that i measured to the temperatures that they measured and then on the right, we also did a computer simulation for comparison. And that MMS satellite is kind of the yellow circle that's hidden down in there. And with, but with the simulation, we got these similar localized structures of hot temperatures. So this is a big thing I do is sort of get this global image and then try to figure out what's going on across the whole magneto tail. Because during um, active events in the magnetosphere, what happens is you have um, what's called magnetic reconnection, where your magnetic field lines are stretched like a rubber band, and then they let go and they sling back just like a rubber band does um, back towards the earth. And all this stuff gets heated up and accelerated and moves towards earth. And that's where you get these hot blobs that are flowing in to the earth. So I study what's going on during all that. So that's what I've been working on for many years. Now, recently I've got into a couple of newer areas. Let's see if I can make this thing advance. There we go. Um, and so I recently have been part of a, Brit, a big uh, collaboration between people at UNH and people at University of Alaska in Fairbanks, where we are using machine learning to try to do some modeling of this space region and what happens during these active times. And what we're specifically trying to look at in this project is understand these things that we call GICs. These are geomagnetically induced currents. And that's just a long word for the fact that when you have lots of stuff energized, particles moving around in space, 
it ends up inducing currents on anything that's long and metal. So basically our power lines. So all this stuff is moving around in space and you can actually drive extra currents onto the power lines. The power lines aren't able to handle that. And sometimes you can cause power outages um, with these things. So the power companies would really like to know when these events are gonna happen, but there's a lot of dynamics. As you can see, a lot of stuff happens in between when the stuff goes on that causes these active intervals, it deals with what goes on in your geology. So the type of rock in the ground matters, whether you're close to the ocean matters. So there's lots of stuff going on, um, but there's been a lot of years of data taken. Um, so we're taking advantage of the fact that we have, have a lot of data now and we can use some machine learning techniques to try to do some modeling. And one of the advantages there is that there's so much going on here that the physics-based models have to have very high resolution to be able to say, well, what we really need to know is, is this power company at this power station going to be a problem? Rather than saying, you know, across the whole United States, we need it really localized. And getting that resolution in a physics simulation takes a lot of computer power. And so perhaps using a machine learning based model, once it's trained, it can be a lot faster. Um, so that's sort of a goal for providing some forecasting to protect our infrastructure. Another thing that I do is some instrument development. So like I talked about, we have lots of satellites up there taking data. And right now the satellites require um, a lot of expensive, big instrumentation. Um, but what we'd really like to be able to do is put a whole lot of satellites out all over the place in space. Like I said, you only get a measurement for most of these where the satellite is. So you need a whole lot of satellites out there to be able to get measurements all over the place. You know, I'm doing that global imaging thing, but that only gives us some limited information. We want more. <laughs> so we need to be able to have little instruments that are easy to manufacture. And so this is something that I've been working on. This is um, basically etched out of a silicon wafer, just like computer chips are made. So the idea is that once we get this instrument able to work, you manufacture a whole bunch of them cheaply. If they don't work, you throw them away because they were cheap and you just find the ones that actually work well, which is totally different than the way instruments are made right now. But the idea is that you can measure, measure either electrons or ions and they come in through the top and you have a potential difference. These are little channels and this is curved. And the potential difference and the curve means only certain energies can get through that curve, depending on what the potential difference is you put across the channels. And so you can measure how many particles you have as a function of energy, uh, which is a big thing we do in plasma physics to understand what's going on. So uh, we're working on this to be able to put it on uh, smaller satellites. You might've heard about CubeSats. It's another place um, that's, sort of working on this smaller satellite thing. Um, the other thing that this could be used for is actually in the edge of a tokamak. So looking at fusion energy laboratory plasma research, um, this could potentially be an instrument in the edge of that as well. So lots of different directions there. And I still do keep my hand a little bit in the laboratory experimental realm as well when I can. Awesome, yeah, you, got, you wanna still do that hands-on work still, it's the fun stuff. So great. Thank you so much. And everybody, if you have questions, please remember and write them down. We'll be asking them at the end because I'm sure there are a lot of questions about that awesome research. Um, Dr. Sarathia, do you want to go next? What's your science? Why is it important? And why should the community care about it? Yeah, so I can say first off just a, a little bit about what I do, which is a sort of, you know, I think some of the modeling that uh, Amy had mentioned. Um, and so, you know, that involves sort of combining uh, sort of a knowledge of mathematical algorithms to sort of identify and solve these partial differential equations that describe these different systems. Uh, and at the same time, sort of, you know, setting these up in a way that we can put these on these massive supercomputers, uh, mostly through the National Science Foundation and NASA, uh, and then run these simulations. And perhaps one of the hardest things is then to take this massive amount of data that comes out of one of these simulations and try to turn it into some insider knowledge to learn something from this mess of data that we've just created. Um, so I can show an example of one of these uh, models. Let's see, is this going to play? Yeah. Uh, and so this was a pretty cool thing. This was actually a, a simulation that I ran that we gave to the Hayden Planetarium 
which way they did this very cool uh, visualization of uh, and using one of their uh, shows, uh, Worlds Beyond Earth. Um, and this is a simulation of geospace, the near Earth environment that's shaped both uh, figuratively and literally by the sun, uh, the solar wind blowing plasma that sort of compresses the Earth's magnetic field on the day side and sort of stretches it out into this tail, a sort of tadpole like shape on the night side. Um, and so we use, you know, for simulation like this, we might easily spend a, a million uh, what are called CPU hours, meaning if you were to run this on a single CPU, it would take a single uh, uh, processor would take a million years to run, but we can of course do that much faster because we can use tens of thousands uh, of compute cores. Um, and so this involves sort of uh, developing each of these individual models. So we have models that describe the plasma in the magnetosphere so much further away from Earth, uh, different models that describe sort of the lower or the upper atmosphere. And of course, each of these models has been developed over decades by different research groups. And so somehow we need to take all of these models uh, and put them together, actually run them all at these massive computational scales, which will produce terabytes of data, which we then need to figure out what to do with and hopefully write a paper about. Um, and of course we do this not just to sort of answer scientific questions, uh, but there's also of course, uh, you know, pragmatic reasons to try to better understand geospace and you know, one of the obvious ones is that space is increasingly where we keep our stuff. Um, so the planetarium folks did this very cool uh, visualization. So you can see here in these green piece, uh, these green uh, uh, tracks, each of these is a satellite trajectory. Uh, and so they call this sort of the technosphere, this cloud of just technology that we have around the planet that we rely on. Um, and as this sort of zooms out, you can see just how precarious that all starts to look when it's being buffeted by this solar wind. Um, and so Amy mentioned uh, GICs, which happen on the ground, but in space, there's also other dangers. So uh, there's sort of the killer electrons, sort of these electrons of the radiation belt that get this bad, uh, bad uh, PR. They're often called the killer, killer electrons because of the damage they can do to uh, satellites. And so it's not just about answering these scientific questions, but also just you know, the fact that we rely on, on these things uh, in a very, very critical way. I think that's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm mesmerized by this video. That's pretty cool. I have to say this was actually super, this was a super cool thing because we then also, uh, you know, the user simulation, then we actually then got to go uh, to New York to the Hayden Planetarium to see the premiere, uh, which was also really fun. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so for our final question, and you both um, actually brushed upon this a little bit earlier in the answer to your first question. Um, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit more this time around. But um, the question is, can you imagine ways in which undergraduate students could be involved with the kind of work that you do? And also, what were the things that you did as an undergraduate to help you along your path? And we'll ask, we'll start with Professor Kesey. Yeah, so um, I do have undergrads working with me. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have a student right now that does, um, looks at the images from um, the ENA image that I talked about first, um, looking at some of those um, and helping analyze those, um, looking at the blobs in the tail. Um, so he's working on that project. Um, and he's actually um, submitted a Goldwater scholarship application um, to study a specific event um, using that data. Um, so there's definitely uh, ways to get involved. Um, if, you, if there are people that do cool research at your institution, um, go check them out, ask them questions, see if there's any way you can get involved in research. So that's the easiest way is to start at your institution where you are, because there's almost always uh, people doing research and they wanna get you involved. Uh, in their research. There's often funding available and they can pay you to do the research. Um, and also um, there's many uh, class credit uh, opportunities depending on uh, what level you're at where you can get class credit to do research as well. So there's both of those opportunities. And some of those things can happen during the summer. So if you're looking for something to do for the summer, um, you can often do the research in the labs during the summer. Now there are also opportunities at other institutions, um, and these are especially during the summer, most of them happen. Um, and I mentioned the REU, uh, Research Experience for Undergraduates, and they happen at all different uh, kinds of institutions, government labs, different universities. Um, and 
I think most of them are sponsored by NSF. So I think NSF keeps a website where you can kind of find all those. Um, but basically search for REU and whatever you're interested in and you can find stuff. And that, that's an application process that usually happens um, around January, February-ish. Um, so check those out. Like I said, I did mine at the NASA National Solar Observatory in Tucson, um, which was an awesome experience because we had a whole group of REU students together because there were also, um, there's a, also astronomy there too. And we got to go up to Kitt Peak Observatory and do observing time on the telescope. And we got to go on a field trip to some places in New Mexico. We saw the VLA and we there used to be an NSO place in New Mexico that we got to go visit. So it was amazing. You get to you know, hang out with people for the summer, talk about research, do cool stuff. Those are great opportunities. Um, there's some other organized things. So keep an eye out and ask your professors for what other things are out there. So um, there's the Department of Energy um, has these things called SULIs, um, something laboratory in internships and the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab um, hosts several of these. So the undergrad I was mentioning that works for me actually has, did one last year and is getting ready to do another one on a different subject this summer. Um, so that's another thing to look into. Um, when Kareem mentioned the NSA, I actually remembered that in addition to my REU, I did a different summer program. It was more focused on the math side of things since, as I said, I was a math major. It was at Carnegie Mellon and it was co-sponsored by NSF and NSA. So there was lots of money for stuff in this program. So we got all kinds of fun stuff and, and food and t-shirts and whatnot. Um, and so there was that. And I think I also did like a week long program at Duke in mathematical biology and learn lots of cool stuff. So, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities to learn things and do research. So just explore them, ask your professors because um, they can really help you get started on those things, but also, you know, Google, you know, back when I was doing it, the internet was very young, <laughs> um, but now you have so many resources at your fingertips. Um, so check all those opportunities out. Yes, definitely. Thank you. I, the same thing happened to me. My first research experience was as an undergraduate at UCLA, going to the graduate students and saying, can I help you with anything? And they were like, yeah, we got we can help you. We have funding to pay you a little bit to do something. And, you know, that was how I, that was my first research experience. So definitely all about that particular method. And of course, you know, research um, or opportunities that are out there that you have to apply to um, are also, you know, very difficult sometimes to get into, but we can try and help people with that as well. So um, Dr. Strathia, same question for you. Can you imagine ways in which undergraduates can be involved? and um, you know, maybe go a little bit more into how you were involved as an undergraduate and what helped you along. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, like I said, even going back to, I think my first research inter internship in high school, um, even though the stuff that I was working on there like uh, was sort of more in the realm of like encryption math and things like that, just the experience of watching researchers solve problems, I sort of fell in love with really, really early. And you know, doing uh, research internships in different labs as I was uh, an undergrad in a lot of different areas, um, was always just a good experience. And I think one thing I would certainly suggest is, you know, it's easy to get caught up on like, is this the lab and the thing, the topic I really want to research, but, you know, just going and doing it is always a good experience. I think uh, being able to work in that thing, you learn lots of new, new things about that subject that you might not have thought about or, or expected to really enjoy. Uh, but also just learning about that process, I think is, is really cool to see the difference between, you know, when you're explaining something in a lesson, how it's sort of point A to point B in a very clean line. And then the reality of it when researchers are doing it of constant stumbling blocks and dead ends and you know <laughs> aggravation and all, and all of this, it's a very different thing. And you really get a better, I think, sense of just how the research process really happens and works. Um, I, uh, I guess going to the other part of the question, uh, I think there's, you know, there's a huge amount of stuff to, to work on with us, I think. Um, I mentioned, you know, about just the scale of data that we can generate. Um, the, the simulation I showed generates a terabyte of data per hour of the geospace system that we're modeling. And so just understanding what to do with that data is a huge problem. Obviously not one unique to us, but it's this huge problem that we're always struggling with. You know, we need to really reinvent and we need to learn how to learn from data that we can generate at that scale. At these highest end supercomputers, the amount of stuff that we can generate is 
you know, trying to turn any of that into knowledge in my brain is a huge challenge. Um, but there's lots of new tools, you know, there's data mining, there's machine learning, uh, lots of other very sophisticated, very powerful tools that are coming online that we can actually use to try to tame just that large, uh, unreasonable mess of, of numbers. And so I think there's lots of opportunities to do that. And, and certainly, and again, in a way where those are also just very useful skills to have uh, in terms of technology and being able to work with data like that. Um, so I think there's certainly data analysis and data mining. Um, there's sort of visualization. We have you know, these very cool, uh, if you know how to do it and have the, the right mindset, you can actually turn the simulation data into some very cool looking things. Uh, and I, I have no idea how to do that. So I would love any help uh, on that front. Um, and then also I think actually even just doing more direct, like getting on a supercomputer and learning how it works and writing code that you can actually run on a supercomputer uh, and learning sort of the, the ins and outs of taking a physics problem and turning it into math and then turning that math into something you can put on a, on a supercomputer and actually run it. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, um, let's see. Oh, Slava wants me to ask you, what's the biggest simulation you've ever run? Um, let's see, I think it was 10,000 compute cores. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> what it was, so basically like, you know, your average laptop has four compute okay. cores. <laughs> and so we ran a 10,000 on that, uh, 10,000. Wow time to, uh, to sort of chug through. And, and that was actually, I think, the simulation that we, we gave to the Hayden Planetarium. That's amazing, wow. All right, I, well, it's, no, it, it, it's a very nice feeling of, of power when you sort of hit enter, running one of these things on a supercomputer, knowing that you're running a simulation that's gonna make a non-trivial contribution to global warming. <laughs> right, all right. <laughs> Um, so we'll go ahead and open it up to questions now. I was thinking maybe Slava, you can put up that slide real quick um, before we get right into the question, just so everyone has a chance to see the internship opportunities that we do have. And we had also put a link in the chat um, of where some of these, you can also see where some of these opportunities are available. And I do just wanna mention like, especially at APL, you know, we know that deadlines can be a barrier. Sometimes you might miss it and you didn't mean to. You know, there, there are ways we can be creative to get around some of these issues um, to help you all. If it's really something that you wanna do and you have a lot of potential, we wanna remove those barriers that might keep you from being able to fulfill your potential and have these experiences. So please, you know, if you ever encounter any problems, um, feel free to reach out to us that, and there's other um, contact information at the bottom of that slide there. And we'll be having more of these discussions. We're just getting started. And so again, you know, what this really is about for us is making sure that these opportunities are accessible to you and that you know that they're, you know, you will succeed at them. So we're here to support that for you. So we'll go ahead and open it up to questions now. Um, I don't know if I see, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Did anybody want to raise their hand and ask a question? Can't see, let's see here. Or you can just, do people have the ability? Oh, here we go. Um, to Amy, how much data do you need to predict GICs? So right now what we're working with is um, we're using solar wind data. Um, so there's satellites out about an hour in front of the, mag when the sun hits the stuff from in the magnetosphere. Um, those have been taken, I think we have, I guess 30 years of data. Um, and then we have ground magnetometer stations taking magnetic field measurements on the ground, um, which is sort of our proxy for the GICs. And they've been taken for about the same amount of time. So we about, have about 20 to 30 years of data. Um, so that's what we're working with first. We do want to, take advantage of some of the satellite emissions in between, which obviously there's not as much of that available. Um, and one of the things that might actually be interesting out of this is to say, wow, this parameter really improved our prediction ability. We need a permanent mission that takes that measurement so that we have forecasting ability. 
So that's a one, one idea that we have out of this project that would be nice to figure out. Another thing that we have to think about though is um, how much lead time do we have? So like I said, if you're doing the, the physics simulations and they take a lot of computing power, it takes some time, whereas maybe the machine learning can cut out some of that, but we still need some lead time. So that's why I said, you know, the solar wind is nice because it's an hour ahead, but it's one point in space and we're trying to figure out globally what's going to happen after it goes through the magnetosphere. Um, so, you know, sure, we can predict like a minute ahead, but that's probably not going to help us very much. So we got to play around with what what data is going to give us the right thing to and but what is also going to give us enough lead time to run the prediction and say, hey, this is where something bad is going to happen. You guys need to prepare. So there's not really a how much data do we need <laughs> answer. Um, the more data, the better. <laughs> Ain't that the truth. <laughs> um, all right, thank you. Um, and um, Dr. Sarathia, I'll ask, I'll ask you this question. Um, describe or let us know what your most important class that you took as an undergraduate, did you think it was? And it doesn't have to be a science class. Let's see. Um, as an undergraduate, I think it would probably have been uh, intro astronomy, since that was actually the first good astronomy class I ever took. Um, but it also then, uh, that, that got me uh, working, I, I ended up uh, spending actually two years working with that uh, professor in their research lab doing sort of modeling of uh, sort of uh, working on like writing and running these dark matter simulations and sort of trying to uh, learning about the nuts and bolts of how those work. So that was definitely, uh, I think, my favorite uh, class. That's great. Um, all right, here's a question about your research. What kind of uncertainties are in your simulations and can you predict geospace completely? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> There's a huge amount of uncertainty, um, and you know, sort of, uh, it's sort of like a, the 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 big brother to all of this. I think is uh, weather. You know, like being able to say, is it going to rain tomorrow versus is it going to rain next week? There's uncertainty that goes into the data that we put into our simulations. Um, there's uncertainty in that we make a, the equations that we use are already approximations, so there's sort of physical approximations built in that we know to some level or another are incorrect. Um, there's sort of parameterized or calibrated models to try to account for effects that we don't have in our model, but those are sort of black magic knobs that you sort of turn and get right. Um, so there's always going to be, you know, a lot of uncertainty in the data you're putting in. There's uncertainty in how well your model can actually reproduce reality as well. Um, and so one of the major things we want to do in our, in our center, of course, is try to better understand that uncertainty, try to better understand sort of what are the biggest holes in our ability to predict what's happening in geospace and how can we improve it? Um, but at the same time, of course, you know, if, if you don't, if, you know, if, if you get wrong in a model that it was supposed to rain here and it rains here, you can still learn things about that. You can still learn, you know, how many umbrellas do people need and things like that. Great, um, yeah. That's a that metaphor that's getting away from me already, but yeah. No, that's a good metaphor. I mean, it's, it's weather, right? And predicting and uncertainties and nature and yeah, all that stuff. Um, same question to you, Professor Kesey. What kind of uncertainties go into these images of these temperature blobs that you showed us? Oh man, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we do have to make a lot of assumptions. Um, just in the way we do the measurement, there's of course a lot of error. But one of the things that I do when I do my temperature calculation is I'm assuming a distribution that defines what the temperature is. That is not always the case. So it's not really always actually a temperature, but we kind of get a feel for how much energization is there going on. So even if it's not really the actual temperature, it at least says, you know, hey, something interesting is happening here where we see these higher temperatures. Um, the other thing that's happening is because we are taking this picture remotely and we're on a satellite. So the satellite, of course, is moving. Um, so our view, our point of view is always changing. And in order to create a fixed map, I'm projecting down into basically the equatorial plane. And so as you project down, 
the instrument pixel kind of looks at this, you know, angular piece. And as you project down, it gets bigger and bigger. So your spatial resolution is not so great. And it gets worse the further out you're projecting. Um, so a lot of uncertainties <laughs> are, are go into this technique, but you kind of have to say, well, you know, you have to be honest and say, here's all the assumptions we make. Here's all the issues with the instrument and the technique and everything, but this is what we have and let's see what it tells us. And so that's kind of the way you have to deal with <laughs> all that error. Yeah. Sometimes it is just trying and seeing what fits and, and then what doesn't fit, then you know, okay, it's not that. So at least narrows down your possibilities a little bit. All right, well, we're at 445 now, and um, I want to thank our two panelists. Um, thank you so much for all the information you gave us and the experiences you shared for, with us, very, um, very helpful. And Slava, if you want to say anything, I'll go ahead and let you close it out. Yeah, I'll just say uh, thank you again to our wonderful panelists. And uh, yeah, <laughs> this has been great. I, I learned a lot myself. Um, and it's been a long time since I was an undergrad. <laughs> uh, so yeah, please uh, feel free to um, uh, email us with any questions. Uh, if you need any help getting uh, to any websites, finding opportunities, you know, anything you'd like, uh, any questions you might uh, have for us, feel free to email and just take a screenshot of this. And we will do this again in three weeks. I'll go back to uh, slide number one right here. We'll do it in, on April 15, same time, same place, same Zoom call, and you'll uh, see this advertised at your corresponding universities. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.